Shalom. This week we are reading Parshat Bishalach, which includes the famed Az Yashir, the Song of the Sea, one of the unique songs of the Torah. In Parshat Bishalach, all the drama of the Exodus unfolds before us and around us and inside of us as we participate, as we did then, in leaving Egypt. The Parsha is amazing and so full of many core concepts and important principles of Torah. It would take us a lifetime to discuss it and to try and do it justice. For example, the whole idea of the Song of the Sea, which contains so many secrets of the resurrection of the dead and the final redemption. Our sages tell us that the Song of the Sea is really just a code because actually they sang it then at the splitting of the sea, but even then they knew that it was an allusion to the song that will be sung at the ultimate redemption. We've discussed this before. Also the secrets of the Song of Miriam and Pashat Haman, the section of this week's Torah portion that describes the manna that Hashem provided for the children of Israel during the 40 years that they wandered in the desert, from which we learn all the secrets of livelihood, of Parnassah. We also learn in this week's Torah portion that twice the people suffered from a lack of water. And of course, Moshe so famously hit the rock at Masel Meribah. A Malik attacks the people at the end of the Torah portion in Rifidim. All of these concepts are connected. But this week, I'd like to examine one particular incident that might appear to be a very small detail when we examine the vast tapestry of Parsha B'Shalach. It might get lost. We may not think about it so much or pay so much attention to it, but it's enigmatic and it seems difficult to understand even on a simple level. So now, the splitting of the sea, let's start there, the Sea of Reeds. The experience was magnificent uplifting, inspiring, maybe surreal, life-changing, prophetic. It was the highest states of God consciousness. All of Israel became prophets. Our sages tell us that even the humblest and simplest individual experienced a higher level of, prof of prophetic enlightenment than even Ezekiel. And even the unborn children in their mother's wombs also sang the song at the sea. So all of Israel walking through dry land and the destruction of the Egyptian pursuers, all of this was the clearest possible message driven home with the sharpest frequency that as they sang in the song, this is my God and I will extol him. It was like they, they just had this incredible perception of God. It represents that experience, the deepest soul-rooted Torah knowledge that transcends knowledge and becomes like a tangible fixed reality. But this is very strange because all of a sudden, right after this incredible experience, the children of Israel face an unprecedented crisis. And this is their first real crisis now. It will be the first of many, but it's different from, for example, the crisis that occurred before the splitting of the sea, back in chapter 14 and verse 11, where we read that they said, were there no graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the wilderness? Why did you take us out from Egypt? In case you thought that that was actually the first crisis since leaving Egypt, no. You see, that was before the astoundingly revelatory, life-changing experience of the splitting of the sea, which caused every one of them to prophesize over the sheer knowledge of the reality of God in their lives. That was before, but now, and here's what I don't understand. They're traveling for three days in the wilderness of Shur, and they can't find water. Let's read from verse 22. Moses led Israel away from the Red Sea, Sea of Reeds, and they went out into the desert of Shur. They walked for three days in the desert, but did not find water. They came to Marah, they could not drink water from Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah, which means bitter. The people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now, listen, we can't judge. We certainly can't be judging harshly because, after all, they're people. It's a desert. They're thirsty. Serious situation. There's no water. It's a legitimate grievance. But what, what is this really, I mean? Could they have thought 
that God had already abandoned them? After witnessing the incredible miracle of their deliverance, the splitting of the sea, and their march on dry land through walls of water, a miracle that literally becomes the template, the benchmark, the defining example of what a miracle is and the microcosm of the actual final redemption and the resurrection of the dead, and they're complaining to Moshe, what shall we drink? They couldn't drink the water because it was bitter, so they called the place Mara, meaning bitter. What's really going on here? Why this bitterness occurring just here, just days after the greatest revelation of godliness in their lives? And then we read, verse 25, So he cried out to Hashem, and the Lord instructed him concerning a piece of wood, or it could be read, showed him a tree, which he cast into the water, and the water became sweet. There he gave them a statute and an ordinance, and there he tested them. The words in Hebrew, Vayorehu Hashem etz, that Hashem showed him, or perhaps the connotation is taught him, etz, which means a tree, and also wood. Hashem showed him something, a tree, taught him something, gave him some advice. What was this, you'll see why we call it advice. What was this wood? or this tree. So there are two opinions expressed by our sages as to the identity of this wood. It was the wood of a tree. One opinion maintains that it was actually species known as Nerium oleander. The oleander, you will recall, is an evergreen shrub or small tree in the dogbane family of Pasanaceae, something like that. Toxic, toxic in all of its parts. In fact, it's the, one of the most poisonous of commonly grown garden plants, the oleander. The other opinion is that it was the ulia, which is the olive, whose wood is very bitter. In any event, all authorities agree <clears throat> that whatever this was, it was bitter wood. And so the advice, I'm saying advice because Hashem showed him etz, which is associated with the word etza, same roots as tree, the word for advice, the advice that Hashem gave Moshe was to sweeten the bitter with bitter. So if this wood was bitter olive or oleander, God is basically instructing Moshe and showing him that you can take, you can make from the bitter sweet by adding bitter. This certainly appears to be strange. It almost reminds one of the concept of homeopathy, a much disputed alternative approach to healing. Homeopathy, as everybody knows, is a system of alternative medicine created in 1796 by Samuel Hahnemann, based on his doctrine of, as we like to say in Latin, similia similibus curenter, like cures like. The term homeopathy was coined by Hahnemann and first appeared in print in 1807. However, homeopaths claim that Hippocrates himself may have originated homeopathy around 400 BC when he prescribed a small dose of mandrake roots to treat mania, knowing it produces mania in much larger doses. And in the 16th century, the pioneer of pharmacology, Paracelsus, declared that and I quote, small doses of what makes a man ill also cures him. And of course, isn't this the basis of vaccinations? Isn't the flu vaccine, doesn't it contain the flu? In any event, Samuel Hahnemann, 1755 to 1843, gave homeopathy its name and expanded its principles in the late 18th century. Some people consider homeopathy to be quackery and clearly, this is not the time or the place to defend or criticize homeopathy, nor is that my intention here in Parshat B'Shalach. It's really not our subject. You may be wondering, why am I discussing homeopathy here in Parshat B'Shalach? Personally, I've always been of the opinion that if the medical establishment is against an alternative method of treatment, it's probably a pretty good idea. But here's my point with this whole tangent. I've always been fascinated by the concept that the malady itself, the illness, contains, and indeed, is the key to the cure. But what's really going on here in Parshat B'Shalach? 
we read, and they traveled three days in the desert and did not find water. Really? If this is a verse in the Torah, then it's something that we need to know forever. And this happened right after the splitting of the sea? So this incident is not minor. The Torah is not a history book, including some events and omitting other incidences along the way. What happened at Mara, like everything else that we find in the Torah, conveys a deep secret and a life lesson for all of us. So what is in this for us? The children of Israel just experienced the high of their lives. Splitting of the sea drove home for them in the most wondrous way th that the involvement of God in their lives was so very real. And then they journeyed for three days and they didn't find water. What does this mean they couldn't find water when they found it, it was bitter? When they stood by the sea, they experienced a tremendous God-given illumination of divine enlightenment. Their eyes were so wide open, it could be said that they actually never really knew what it meant to be alive until that moment because they saw, they experienced firsthand, beyond any doubt, how precious they are to Hashem that He would do such a thing for them. And the experience uplifted them and they sang the Song of the Sea with great inspiration and desire and, and connection to godliness and the holy excitement of what it means to be an enlightened soul on fire for God. Singing this song was nothing less than the result of divine inspiration. They sang out, Hashem yimloch liolam ve'ed, which means God will reign forever. Because that, they saw so clearly, was the, is the only truth, the only thing that's real. And of course, they wanted to feel that way forever. Who wouldn't? They never wanted to come down from that level of inspired revelation. They wanted that feeling of clarity, that clear, precise vision of knowledge, of godliness in their lives. They wanted it to stay fixed in their hearts forever. But as we all know, things become familiar. We get used to things. They get old. So they got used to it. They had thought that they could never be brought down from the high place they had ascended to. That they, they took it for granted, that it was theirs, that they owned it, as it were, this light. But then, they went three days without water. And of course, as we know from the book of Isaiah, Hoi kol sameh l'chul Woe, let all who are thirsty come to the water. There's no water other than Torah. Water is an allusion to Torah, meaning three days after this experience, they got disconnected. They lost the feeling, the desire, all the excitement that they had before. They didn't feel it anymore. It came like, ho-hum. But through all their travelings, through the wilderness of Shur, Moshe was attempting to arouse them, to understand, to show them that they really have nothing in their lives on their own, that they always need to renew their relationship with Hashem. And then we read, and they came to Maratha, and they couldn't drink the water from Marah because it was bitter. Now let's understand this as an allusion to their spiritual crisis, which is a well-known crisis that we all face at times. How to keep high, not, God forbid, artificially. After having gone through such an exhilarating experience, after having reached such a spiritual high, only three days after walking through the sea on dry land, they looked at their connection to Hashem, and they saw that they didn't feel the same way. They, say, they didn't feel the same joy, the same excitement, the same desire. The thrill was gone. And they were surprised, and they were wondering at themselves, thinking, What's up with this? Did I do something wrong here? Is it, is it me? What's wrong with me? I mean, I know that nothing's really changed. On the deepest cerebral level, in their brain, in their minds, the deepest level of knowledge, they, they knew intellectually that everything is the same. Everything that we knew yesterday, we still know today. We still know that all that Torah. We remember singing the song. We know that Hashem took us out of Egypt and that Hashem took us down onto the sea and into dry land. We know today what we knew yesterday. But yesterday, they said, we felt that we were on fire from all of this, alive, that there was life in these things. When we sang, this is my God and I will extol Him, the knowledge was full of vigor. And now it seems lifeless and devoid of the same joy and excitement. We know we still have the information, but the heart is one thing and the brain is something else. And today, how many times have we all said this? I have all this information, but my heart isn't feeling it. And so this is probably reminding you of, um, in 1964, on his album, Another Side of Bob Dylan, 
Bob Dylan sang in Black Crow Blues, Sometimes I'm thinking I'm too high to fall. Sometimes I'm thinking I'm too high to fall. Other times I'm thinking I'm so low I don't know if I can come up at all. Therefore, they named it Mara. The verse says, and this, what did they name Mara? This is what they called bitter. The realization, the experience, the anxiety, the feeling that they lost the level that they had. When they looked at themselves and they realized about themselves, we don't really have that light deep down that we had then. We don't own it. We don't have that Torah for ourselves. We don't have it here in the palm of our hands. There's no app we can turn on or off. It's like, you know, in the Holy Temple there are various offerings. There's an offering called the Thanksgiving offering, which a person who wants to make a special declaration of his relationship with Hashem, for whom he feels that a special thing happened, a miracle was wrought, he wants to bring a Thanksgiving offering. There's a particular rule regarding that offering of the person who wants to thank Hashem for the miracle in his life, because he got such a clear understanding of his relationship with Hashem, there's a rule about that offering. It has to be eaten completely that day. Nothing can be left over to the next day. What does that symbolize? That a person who has a miracle occur for him, he shouldn't think that he's always going to have that same clarity. He shouldn't think he's invincible, that he's bulletproof, that he has nothing to fear of, again, losing that level. Because a person has a high today, he should be there in that moment today, but it's not his forever. A person has no guarantee in this world at all. That's why we always have to be sensitive to each moment that Hashem sends us. So how do you sweeten that bitterness, meaning that, how can we always remember to realize always that Hashem is always with us? So they were thinking to themselves, we know that we have the same Torah that we had before, so why do we feel so lifeless? Just as today, we look at ourselves, we go, we go way up, we fall way down, and even in the moment of our greatest high, a human being knows we can't control this. We, can't, we know that ultimately we will continue to struggle. We have to struggle again and again to maintain our energy level and our desire to serve Hashem and not fall into complacency because the worst thing of all in serving God, the worst enemy we always teach, is complacency, getting used to something, getting bored, doing something by rote. So we always emphasize the secret of the showbread in the Holy Temple, the Lechem Apanim. Our sages teach that the bread was baked on Friday and placed on Shabbat, and when they, the Kohanim, when the priests came to change it the following week, they found that the breads were still hot, piping hot and fresh like the moment they were placed there, like the moment they were baked a week ago. And the secret of the showbread is very simple, that it's in the Hechal, it's in the sanctuary, in the holy place. A person who feels that they're in God's presence doesn't get moldy, doesn't get stale or old or dried out or bored. But what can I do about this? What, there is no app for this problem and there's no number to call. So how do we try and see to it that we can always refresh ourselves? So here it is. This is such a beautiful secret that Hashem taught Moshe. And he cried out to Hashem. He cried out, Moshe, and he showed him a tree. And he threw it into the water, and the waters were sweetened. Hashem showed him the eitz, the wood, the etza, the advice. What did he show him? What did God teach us? Look at the tree. Look at the bitter wood. Look, look deeply into the bitterness itself and understand that everything comes from the same source, from Hashem himself. He showed him the bitterness. He didn't tell Moshe to throw it into the water. Moshe knew that for himself. God showed Moshe, look at the place that you are in right now. Why is it bitter? Only because you're not remembering where the root is, where it's coming from. Everything is coming from Hashem. So you fall into the, into the vulnerability of forgetfulness, and you think the moment is gone. You want to feel that way forever. You want it to stay that way forever. You think you had something and now it's gone. But just because you can't always feel the same, the same way, the same motivation, doesn't mean that anything's changed. And it certainly doesn't mean that God has changed or that our relationship with Him has changed. And these cycles, 
Sometimes I'm thinking I'm, I'm so high, other times I'm thinking I'm so low. This is the very fabric of the human condition. But the bitterness is self-generated and self-defeating. It's a test. The verse tells us specifically, explicitly, and there he tested them. It's a challenge to recognize the root, that we're not here on our own. Every tree grows because Hashem is shining down on it, meaning each situation is the will of Hashem for this particular moment. It's not always up to us. That realization is enough to turn it sweet right away because it brings us back to the knowledge of the level where everything is good, of the level of Hashem's will. There's a verse in Isaiah 11 about the wolf lying down with the lamb in the future. The idea being that in the future when Hashem makes this illumination constant, how in the highest and clearest level of reality everything is bound up together inexorably in a higher unity. There is no conflict or competition. Where the root is, from where everything emanates, then we will no longer be subject to this, if you'll pardon me, bipolar type of behavior. We will understand Hashem's constancy in our lives. And that's when there'll be a global change as well. There'll be a change in this world as well and peace. The same thing here, Hashem is showing him the beginning of this process. This tree, its roots, meaning look to where everything is coming from, from Hashem himself. And right away, that is enough to sweeten it. This is the most profound teaching that, that God is giving to Moshe forever, that you don't need to look somewhere else for the help in this situation, but in the very place where you're feeling your own inadequacy, in that place where we feel low and sense that something is off, that something is missing, that too is from Hashem. So make the bitter into sweet, meaning everything is part of His plan. Even how you feel now, that realization is what turns it sweet. This is the idea of the advice of sweetening the bitter with the bitter, because it's not really bitter at all. Realizing that this too is from Hashem, so no wonder it is a test to realize that this is Hashem's will, that we serve Him now from this place, even if I feel lacking. It's like the camp of Israel that travels during the day with a pillar of cloud and at night with a pillar of fire. Sometimes we're in the darkness and we look for that illumination because it's Hashem's will that we serve Him now. As we are, let it go. It is what it is. We can't be obsessed with the feeling now like we felt before. We sweeten the bitter with the bitter. It's all good. And then we read, And there He gave them an, a statute and an ordinance. And there He tested them. There's a unique tradition. Our sages teach us that in this place, Mara, that God gave over to Israel specific ordinances of the Torah before the Sinai Revelation, that He already gave them specific commandments here at this place. And what were they? Shabbat, to keep the Sabbath, and the Para Aduma, the ordinance of the red heifer that we find in Numbers 19, and the concept of the dinim, the various laws about how we treat each other in different situations. And all these things are connected. What is Shabbat all about? It's that a person refrains from activity that brings about a change because we realize on Shabbat that our, uh, that our own efforts don't really change anything. We connect on Shabbat to Hashem's will. We just look at that will. And there's a statement in the Zohar that Shabbat is Hashem's name. Meaning, instead of being distracted on that day from our own efforts, thinking that we're doing something ourselves and forgetting about Hashem, we realize that there is this fixed holiness in our lives all the time. That's Hashem's will. And when it comes to para duma, the concept of the red heifer, everybody knows that that stands for the fact that we actually don't know anything. That the para duma is the epitome, the embodiment of the concept of chok, the ordinance of the Torah which transcends human knowledge, that we'll never really understand why it works the way it does, how it renders purity because it stands for this idea of Hashem's commandments and His will and our inability to really understand because we can't know everything and actually we don't know anything in this world. The, the concept of the dinim, of the various laws that are given over how to act, how to interact between individuals in society constantly as a reflection at this moment of the reality of Hashem's will. And this concept 
of living with Hashem at each moment, thanking Him for the now, and not getting bogged down in the past, and what a test it is, is such a key concept throughout the entire Torah. And the bitter waters of Marah makes this into a major theme of our Parsha. So indeed, it's very fitting that on that same allegorical level, we encounter it again at the close of this Torah portion, the Battle of Amalek. It's a well-known tradition that the word Amalek has the same gematria, the same numerical value as the word safik, meaning doubts. On a spiritual level, the goal of the spirit of the arch enemy, the arch sworn enemy of Israel and of Hashem, Amalek, their goal is to sow the seeds of self-doubt within us, to curb our enthusiasm, as it were, to make us feel that we can't do it, that we are not serving Hashem in the right way. So no wonder God tells us at the end of this Torah portion that He will erase the memory of Amalek from under the heavens, that He Himself is perpetually at war with Amalek from generation to generation. Because the waters of Marah remind us that we have the ability ourselves to turn from doubts and to remember that the secret of serving God at all times with everything we have is to turn the bitter itself into sweet.